Imagine being locked in a prison cell. I can't tell you how long I laid there, you know. It seemed like an eternity. Six foot by nine, for 23 hours a day. You know, I wake up uh, soaking wet, sweating some time. For decade after decade. I just feel as though you're being squeezed to death. Now imagine doing all of that alone. It is a reality for tens of thousands of prisoners in America, where solitary confinement is common. Inside this prison in Louisiana, Albert Woodfox endured isolation for almost all of the 43 years he was behind bars. But now, he is finally able to relish his freedom. You know, uh, I'm trying to buy a house. To he is not bitter, but he is angry and scarred by what he saw. It don't get no darker than watching a man go insane in the cell and you fight hard to try to save him and, and lose the battle. I fought, you know, to try to save man. we seen going insane. It don't get any darker than that. Yeah, I can't tell you how many men, men that I, you know, form strong bonds of friendship with go insane, you know. In 1972, Wood Fox and another inmate, Herman Wallace, both in prison for armed robbery, were accused of murdering a guard, Brent Miller. There was never any forensic evidence. The men alleged they were being punished for their black activism. And many observers thought there had been a miscarriage of justice. Were you guilty of that murder? Absolutely not. Yeah, I'm absolutely innocent. We were the sacrificial lambs. They had already picked their demons. After years of legal appeals, Wood Fox was finally released in February of this year. His lawyers and supporters were ecstatic. America's longest serving solitary confinement prisoner was suddenly a free man. Ironically, the biggest shock Wood Fox encountered as he re-emerged into a society in turmoil was what has not changed since he was locked up, the fight for justice and racial equality. Yeah, the only difference is when I left, racism was brutal and open in American society. Uh, now nah, it's more subtle. You know, the uh, uh, racists and bigots in this country use cold words. Wood Fox now has a mission to speak up for those kept in prolonged isolation. It is immoral to treat another human being the way we do in, in America and, a, and around the world. And we're trying to give voice to those hidden behind the walls of solitary confinement. Wood Fox describes such isolation as nothing less than a brutal attack on a prisoner's sanity. Robert Moore, News at 10, Louisiana. Come on, we're on. Welcome to the Gilchrist Experience. Uh, again, we have Victor Pate, our uh, second chance president from NAN. And we're talking about incarceration, uh, solitary confinement. We're all familiar with the Khalif Browder case, uh, which we'll see his mother a little later on. But today we have uh, a gentleman who spent 30 years in prison, Anthony Small. Yes. And he's going to give us a little idea of what it takes to come out here in the Trump era. And because uh, he got, he was released, uh, what, six days uh, before the inauguration? Tell us about the transformation and what it was like before you went in and how is it now? Thank you Welcome for to us. the show. Thank you for us for having me, and right. uh, I appreciate being here. It's a great opportunity to tell my story. Um, hopefully, I can touch some lives and help some young people Amen. make better decisions. Uh, before I went in, I was a young man. I was 20 years old um, with no sense of direction. I was living in Far Rockaway, Queens, in a project called Edgeman, mm. and uh, it's pretty. He said, mm, "So mm. you know, it's pretty bad out did there." Some work out. Yeah, and um, I did too. Unfortunately, not as good as the work you were doing trying to clean the streets up. I was messing them up. Um, so I was in the 80s. I was um, robbing drug oh, dealers. Oh, that's the time. That's yeah, the time. I was, I was robbing drug dealers in the 80s. And unfortunately, in a blotch robbery, um, someone was killed in, in the commission of a crime, um, unfortunately. And 
I wound up also before that incident, I wound up shooting someone and um, assault, I got convicted for assault in six to 18 years, I had 25 to life. And the judge decided that he couldn't do the court justice and he said the only way he could do the court justice was to give me the death penalty, but he wasn't able Whoa. to. Whoa. Yeah, 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 Judge John Leahy, um, Supreme Court J1 was the court mm -hmm. that I was in. A pure homicide part and he was a, he was a pretty, uh, you know, he was the person that really had vindictiveness about mm -hmm. himself. Well, that was the 80s. Yeah. This is, uh, I mean, the 80s, I would say, uh, once Reagan came in in 1980, uh, it was planned genocide. Yeah. It's all, I mean, that was all the coke was... Crack. Crack yeah. and the whole elimination of liberties for black people in particular. And it was also the beginning of the 80s was a decade of greed. Sure. When it was no longer... Uh, People used to be ashamed of being greedy <laughs> until the 80s came. Yeah. I mean, all, uh, people have always been greedy, but it became a, a fad. Yeah, you know, yeah. it was people were proud to be a, sure. an asshole. Is that what I would call it? <laughs> sure. So it was all right. The corporate raiders were popular in the 80s. So, so under all this disguise and. and tell us more about what it was like after coming in, going in at 20 years old. Yeah, I was 20. I had just turned 20, actually, and I had you never... You had no education? Well, no. I, I had... I, I had... Edu I, wasn't a, I wasn't a dumb kid. That's the, that's the part that, you okay. know, that gets me, is that... Um, you look at that person, you call it a dumb kid. Yeah, that's what it was, because I knew better. And ah, okay. I knew better, and I just, just wanted to be in the streets. What I didn't share with you is that I'm a second generation of incarcerated male in my family to be serving okay. a life sentence. Oh, man. Uh, 1975, my father two got in trouble uh, for mm -hmm. manslaughter. He was sentenced to 15 years to life. Whoa. Approximately oh. 10 years later, I was serving 31 years to life. Ooh. And uh, we was a time where he and I were both in the prison at the same time, because he didn't get out to 1990. We hear about stuff like this, I, but you... The, I, I've you met fathers and sons in prison. I've met oh. fathers and sons in prison. So, the, you know, the one that really suffered in this was my son, of course, and my mother. Ah, um, always the mothers, yeah. yeah. Yeah, my mother and my son, they <laughs> suffered. My mother... I just had a birthday, and she really did a lot of cooking and stuff like that, so she was happy to have me there and have yeah. my friends and my family there. But she really has been through some trauma, um, and so have I, and I still experience it to the day. Mm. Some of the things I've gone through while away incarcerated, things that I probably, some of them I won't talk about today, but um, it was difficult. Well, you have to honor your creator, which is absolutely. your mother. Absolutely, absolutely. You know? Well, I call her my queen, so. Amen. I That's what she queen. is. Yeah. That's it. That's what keeps you going. Absolutely. Well, she was there every day for oh, 30, 30 years, That's five months, 25 days. That's she was there every day, and she made it easier oh, for me. Wow. She made it much easier for me to do the time. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Is incarceration, or was it in the 80s, a badge of courage? Absolutely. Mm. I, absolutely. I, was, oh, I, I, about I didn't that. make it. I didn't make it until I went to prison. Oh. Yeah. Could, you, could you explain that psychology? It's a, it's a sickness, really. It's, 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 That's it's, a black psychology, yeah, right? It, it, it's, it's sad that our young people um, glorify that type of person. When I meet young people today, because the work that I do, I engage a lot of young people. And until I tell them that I was away all that time... They never know. They would never know, but that's what opens them up. That's what makes me interesting. That's what makes me valid. Uh, that's what makes me okay. uh, what they call a credible <laughs> messenger today. Okay. So they'll, then they'll listen because of my experiences. And um, it's unfortunate, but I feel I utilize it to my advantage, you know, to be able to talk to them and share my story with them. Maybe God just made this your calling. He may he took that dumb kid and turned him into a, a my gentleman. Aunt, and my aunt, my aunt yeah. actually gave a testimony before I got locked up that God was gonna settle me. And See? it was, and, and you gotta listen to the creators. You know, I the do. women know. I do. I do. I do. So I feel blessed. I'm on Amen. top of the world. There so. you go. Did you spend a substantial amount of time in solitary? I did. I did spend some time in solitary. In the very beginning of my bid, I spent some time because it was a violent. It's very violent inside of prison for those that may not know. Um, so I was an adolescent, what they called at that time. And I was in a building called C-74. Rikers Island. Yeah, Rikers Island. And it was slashings every day, maybe 30, 40 slashings every day. So I would get in trouble because I wasn't going to be a victim. And um, So you did the slashing? 
Sometimes I did, or sometimes I had to just stand up to the people that were doing the slashing okay. or the stabbings. I've actually seen people get murdered in, in prison in Rikers Island. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, and speaking to what Anthony was about in terms, and, and, and more so speaking about um, being incarcerated and also at a time when it was considered a badge of, of you know, a rite of passage, so to speak. There you go. Like, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and just so twisted how it is that out here in society, you know, people look at you, you know, in uh, admiration because of your positive accomplishments, your educational status, your, your employment status, or your career status. Whereas when you become incarcerated, your status is defined by how violent of a person you were mm -hmm. while you were out in the street. What type of crimes you had committed mm -hmm. while you were out in the street. So that when you get there, everybody already knows who you mm -hmm. are because of mm -hmm. your representation. It precedes you, mm -hmm. and it sort of gives you um, creds. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. nobody don't mess with you. Right. Anything that's going on in the prison underground, normally you're incorporated with that, and okay. it gives you a status. So, like for myself, like when I went to prison, okay, when I got to Attica, people already knew who I was. Oh, yo, this is Vic, man, yo, you know, like all of the all of the movers and shakers, you know what I'm saying, were the people that I gravitated to or even knew who I was. And it was like, don't mess with him. Although I was such a little guy, mm -hmm. I was known in the street to be violent mm. and was not to be messed with. So the level of violence that I committed while I was in the street gave me prison creds. And that gave me a status. So anything that was going down, I was always down. Contraband did, did your and everything size else. make you twice as violent? <laughs> yes, it did. And when I was in the street, right. and because of the fact that, number one, I was always small, right. I always looked at young, and I was always the one you would look at that you wouldn't suspect. Baby right. And face. because of the fact that I knew people would try me, right. I knew I had to come first. in yeah, a violent manner just to let you know that I was not playing. Right. And I had to always, you know, make the first move, so to speak. Like, I right. had a little crew, and when we go to do things like, you know, a robbery, whatever, I was always the first one to make the move. Right. I right. wouldn't right. wait. <laughs> and yeah. everybody else would follow me. So in that, in that character, like I say, it, 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 it awarded me cred. So when I got to prison, everybody basically already knew who mm -hmm. I was. And it was like, you know, people would look, you know, they're always Watch looking the for a guy. victim. Mm -hmm. But when they seen me, it was like, Watch the little guy. Don't mess with him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you were like little Seymour in Cotton Comes to Harlem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> little Seymour and Big yeah. Percy. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting that manipulation mm -hmm. that you spoke of and uh, the sight game that's, that's played in the street. I, I was counseling a young boy a few years back and a little guy. And I, I asked him, I said, you remember the movie Brothers? He says, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I said, if you don't check yourself, you're going to wind up like the gangster in the movie mm -hmm. who wound mm -hmm. up under the ice. I said, oh, yeah, check yeah, yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I say, <laughs> you are looking to get your boys mm -hmm. to do a guy in because you can't do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're not, you're not bad enough to do it yourself. You, 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 he's, he was real flyweight. Mm -hmm. I said, just cool out. You know, his father had passed. He was angry. I said, look, my father died when I was, a, I was even younger than he was. I said, but that's no, that's no reason to dishonor your father's memory. A month later, he was dead. Mm. Mm. You know, and, and that was about eight or nine years ago. And things have changed, okay. you know. Mm -hmm. And we want our kids to really understand that we're all here for a, for a positive purpose. Right. Not, for the, not for the craziness. Okay. We're here for the positive purpose. Um, to address how we change the kids today. Now, you and I go back to a different era. Uh, when he went in, it was 80s. We knew what the 80s were like. The 90s were different, but you came out in the 21st century. <laughs> wow, yeah. what was that like? Um, you mind if I back up a little bit and tell, sure. tell you a little bit more of about myself? Um, when I was incarcerated, um, as you can probably imagine, I thought my life was over. Right, okay. Uh, people used to say, you got to the sun burnout. Mm. And I used to think about that. Wow, 31 in life. I hadn't lived 31 years, so I right. didn't know what that was even like. Um, so it came a point in my life, and, and during my incarceration, um, I was just running around the prisons. 
um, and not doing anything with my life. Then I, one day I decided that I didn't want to be this way anymore. I didn't want to die the man that I was. And I began to um, think about what I wanted my life to be like. I, I developed a vision for myself. Okay. So I didn't have any education when I came in because I didn't want to go to school. I went to three different high schools and I decided I was going to go there and be fly and be cool. Um, but when I finally decided that I wanted to apply myself, I got my GED. I went on from there and got an associate's degree. I got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. Oh, amen, brother. All right. And um, That was a time yeah. when you could get an education. In yes. Well, because you still can now. People are not really, really aware. They don't allow you to have the tap and the Pell Grants. Because when Bataki came in, he snatched that in 95. Ah, Bataki did that. Yeah, of course. And he built all those special housing units, oh, which, which Mr. Pate always talks about. Uh, solitary confinement. He built mm -hmm. um, so many around uh, the state. Uh, they would double bunk solitary okay. confinement boxes. Um, but a long story short, what they have now in the prisons are uh, probably funded programs. Uh, people like, believe it or not, Warren Buffett is a big donor to... Uh, really? Oh, that's yeah. great He's a hear. big that's donor great. to yeah. Harry Belafonte, Warren oh Buffett, uh, Ozzie Davis before he passed, yeah. Ice-T, Coco. They donate monies to... Uh, uh, Hudson Link Mercy College, which is a privately funded mm -hmm. nonprofit organization, oh, ran by former prisoners, by the way, Thank and they you. give us the monies that the support that we need to go to prison. They pay the teachers at mm -hmm. Mercy College. Or actually, I'm not even sure if they even get paid, but they come in at nighttime to Sing Sing Correctional Facility, and they have classes, mm -hmm. and Thank we you. participate. And you in Sing Sing? I was in Sing Sing. When I, okay. My last 15 years was in Sing Sing. My first 15 years was all over the state. Mm -hmm. My last 15 was in Sing 14, seven months was in Sing Sing. I wound up going to Fishgill, making the parole Downstate. board, fortunately, mm -hmm. fortunately making the parole board and being released from Queensboro. Uh -huh. um, I had a high profile case. I had the commissioner or uh, chairperson of parole on my, on my hearing. Her mm -hmm. name is Tina Stanford. And uh, I, I, met, I met actually when me and Mr. Pate Curtis. Went, to, went to Albany. Mm -hmm. I met, uh, is this Curtis or Lewis Cruz? Oh, Curtis. Oh, Curtis Cruz? Yeah. I met the commissioner that actually was on my parole board. He saw me doing the advocacy work that I was doing with Mr. Pate. Oh, and he was very excited about the work I was doing. Great. And I told him, man, you gave me a chance and I won't let you down. Fabulous. Fabulous. That's I'm glad great. you're on this show to show that everybody can turn themselves around. How, how was Queen? Is important role in this? Say it again. I said God played an important role in this? <clears throat> Traditionally, I'm not a religious person, but I'm a spiritual person. I definitely believe in a creator, a God, whatever you want to call him or her. And yes, no question about it. I believe that I was spared by God, uh, my creator. Mm, for God's that. within you. Hey, no question about that. Okay. And I'm just trying to let, let it out. Organized religion is a, a, not a favor of anybody's today. Right, right. We How so was Queensboro? Out there. Yeah. Queensboro was um, a bunch of kids, basically. Um, a lot of it, explain to the people Van Dam. you're talking about? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. I, yes. I've done yes. some stuff over there, yes. too. <laughs> Queensboro is a, a release facility. You, you, you have a date to go home, so okay. everybody there is going home within the next 90 days. Okay. Actually, somebody goes home every day, you know, uh, okay. from out of Queensboro. 10, 20 people may go home every day. And uh, it's a pretty relaxed facility. It's a dormitory. I mean, things still happen there, unfortunately, because kids are stupid. They're on their way back before they leave. You know, they, mm -hmm. they haven't made up their mind yet what they want to do with their lives. Mm -hmm. And they still do stupid stuff, you know. So. I worked a case out of there years ago, unfortunately. But it was a guy that we had arrested, convicted, he was sentenced. And we had the same crime pattern reappear a few years later. Mm -hmm. And we're like, it's funny, it's like television. Mm -hmm. That sounds like Smokey Joe, you know. Mm -hmm. And this is what we do. We call in and out. Mm. You got Smokey Joe upstate? No, where is he? And they run it. He's in Queensboro. So we go to Queensboro the next morning, and we're laying, and the men are coming out, and we spot him. We follow Smokey Joe from Long Island City to Midtown Manhattan to Lower Manhattan, back to 14th Street, on the L train to Brooklyn. He robs a woman on uh, Metro, not Met, uh, Greenpoint Avenue and runs into the tunnel. Mm. So we took care of the lady. We said, don't worry, we know who that is. The next morning we go back. We wait for him. He comes out. Hey, Smokey Joe. Hey, Spoon. Hey, Don. How you doing? Mm. Hey, now listen. 
when did you got back? Yeah, yeah, we get work release and blah, blah, blah. Fine. Long story short, what well, we want to talk to you about the lady you robbed at Greenpoint Avenue mm. yesterday. And he just dropped his head. Get in the car. Mm. <laughs> Don't so yourself. Mm -hmm. he, he said, you, you were there? Yeah, we were there. We, we, were, we were here yesterday when you came out the door. Mm. But he had talked about, this is another thing, I don't know, that was a number of years back, over 25 years ago. And this is one reality. He said that there was a lot of drugs moving through that facility. And between the correction officers and the guys going in and out every day, he said it was a drug mill. And he was, he was still on drugs at the time, using drugs in the facilities that he was in. You know, and like you said, your mind, you know, you change your method of thinking. And, and this is where the correction comes. It has to start in our mind and then our body follows in the process. Unfortunately, we had to send him back upstate, you know, mm -hmm. but the, you, we, you said off camera before we came on, the Department of Correction does not correct. rehabilitate or correct as far as I'm concerned. A lot of times you look at them and you wonder, well, why am I in jail? And they are they controlling me because they're just as bad as I am. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that you see them do. Mm -hmm. um, so even the way they, you know, you can treat your families. Or, you know, they treat me one way, that's fine, okay? I committed a crime, even though that's not my punishment. My punishment, my sentence. Uh, but they treat, you know, your families a certain way, which is really uncalled for. So how do um, they treat the family? Well, just to discourage them, you know, um, the process of visiting, um, ah, okay. there's things that you have to go through. I understand that there's, um, you, know, you know, care, custody, and control. Um, you have to secure the facility. But some of the things are just uncalled for that they do, too. My mother has been through things that I had to actually complain about or write grievances about and uh, complain, you know, that it's do not they, fair. They just do it to piss you off? They do it to discourage you from getting visits yeah. or your people from coming okay. to see you so that mm -hmm. they can break you even, you know, they can break and break you without you. You don't get visits. That's the point where you just come to you say, I don't care anymore. If you don't have family or loved ones, someone coming to see you that cares about you, it's sort of painful, you know, not having visits and be able to, uh, have somebody to love on, you know, and my mother was there the whole time, so. Well, the prison guards were in prison themselves. I mean, what kind of life do they live? I mean, the, the, well, they're caged in for, I mean, I mean, they get to go home after eight, mm -hmm. ten hours or whatever, but they are under that, that energy, that negativity, that, that um, everybody else, that collective energy. That's true, um, but that's by choice, first, yeah. first and foremost. And but sometimes, and you, secondly, don't, you get, don't they get carried away with it sometimes? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I think a lot of times what it is is you have um, officers that maybe, because they're from our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have officers that maybe they remember you or someone like you that was, you know, a tough guy in the street that may have took advantage of them. Okay. So now okay. they have the upper hand. Or you may have a female officer that maybe God didn't do her right, and now she has the upper hand on a guy that you remind her of, uh, and okay. now she's going <laughs> to take it out on you. Yeah, uh, that happens a lot, you I know. Found out, yeah, I found that happens out. Just a lot. To make reference to that, because um, it's a that different world there, yeah. right? Yes. Especially with the females, to me, they seem like they was like extra mean. Yeah. You know, I mean, un unnecessarily. I'm not all of them, you know. I don't want right. to exactly. feel entitled to all. But it just seemed like some of the females uh, were like extra mean. And being in a position of authority and power and control over men, it's like they acted out their hundreds, fantasies. Hundreds of you men at one to time. Be in charge yeah. of men. Hundreds. To tell you when, where, how, you know what I'm saying? Get you beat down, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. On a whim. Mm -hmm. Just because they said you might have said something to them that was out of the way. And necessarily, that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Well, you just She's might remind them of somebody yeah. that did wrong to them. All right, let's go to a roll in. Um, we'll be right, right back at you. Run uh, uh, the second one, not uh, Nan, but uh, Khalif Brothers' mother. And we'll be right back at you. When he came out, he was not the same. It was too much baggage he brought from Rikers with him. 
the memory of beatings, starvation. There was times when he wasn't even allowed to take a shower for two weeks. He was angry. He started getting real paranoid. And his life just spiraled from that. My name is Vanita Browder, and I'm the mother of Khalif Browder. Khalif was on his way home. A police car stopped, and I'm assuming the guy who made the complaint was in the car and told the police that Khalif had robbed him of a backpack. Khalif kept saying, I don't know this guy. I didn't rob him. He was told that they were going to just go to the precinct to kind of sort things out. Well, that sorting out took three years. We went to court. We had a legal aid. And the legal aid told me from the beginning that it was a BS case. He said, don't worry about it. It's a BS case. But meanwhile, my son is being held at Rikers. He would tell me things when I would visit him about being beat. He told me, Ma, I got to fight. If I don't, they're going to think I'm soft. I got to fight. All it did for Khalif was get him in more trouble and more days in solitary. Imagine being locked up 23 hours a day. This is your life. Four walls, that's it. He couldn't take it. They told him, we're going to break you. That's what they told my baby, that they're going to break him. And in reality, they did. At first, you could see he was relieved, that he was home, he could do what he wanted. He started Bronx Community, and he was doing OK, but then, I mean, he was really out of it, and he couldn't keep it up. He quit. He felt that everybody was out to get him. Everybody was a police plant. He stopped speaking to friends. He would get real angry, and then there were times where he would just this look would come over him, and he would just, like, stare. It was a Saturday morning. It was just me and Khalif. And I hear him upstairs doing all this moving around. And I'm like, maybe Khalif is positioning the furniture to get comfortable. I didn't pay attention, because when Khalif is upset, he paces. He paces. Then all of a sudden, I heard this boom. I run upstairs. I didn't see anything. I ran into the next room, and the air, the air conditioning cover was kicked out, and I just saw something hanging. I ran back downstairs, and as I opened the backyard door, Khalif was hanging there. I miss my son. I miss him so much.
that's riveting. Um, you can all feel the pain of a mother losing a child, but what a way to lose a child. After going through all that pain, and he gets out and just can't handle it. Out of the thousand days he spent in prison, 800 of them were in solitary confinement. And um, they call that rehabbing, and it's actual torture. Mm -hmm. And um, um, Victor, yeah. you have a bill still in Albany? Yes, yes we do. Um, currently, we have uh, made some real progress, <coughs> uh, some progress to the point that we are almost have it at the assembly's door waiting for passage. Uh, we are currently in the Ways and Means Committee, um, looking hopefully within hopefully the next couple of weeks to get passed out of that committee. Uh, we have some uh, significant sponsorship <coughs> in the assembly, and we also have uh, some assembly members that have committed to voting for it once it gets to the assembly. Mm -hmm. The assembly speaker, um, Hasty, is a supporter also, and the indication is that once it gets out of the Ways and Means Committee, the next step is the assembly, and that it will be brought to the floor for a vote. Um, however, that will only be half of the job that needs to be done, because you know that a bill, in order for it to become law, has to be passed in both houses, mm -hmm. Senate and Assembly. And unfortunately, as everybody knows, the Senate is um, dominated by the Republicans. Mm -hmm. However, um, because of the amount of support we have gotten uh, from our legislators and continuing support, we are now just so close to the point that we are looking forward to it, to getting passed in the assembly, and it was actually included in the assembly's criminal justice package mm -hmm. as part of the bills to be passed. Um, unfortunately, it was also in the budget, and Governor Cuomo took out all of the criminal justice components of the budget, which basically means that it's now going to be considered a standalone bill. Mm -hmm. Still, we are optimistically hopeful that it will be passed in the assembly. Mm -hmm. uh, then we will focus our attention on the Senate, which it possibly could flip because of upcoming special elections, would possibly mean that there can be a democratic controlled Senate. And if that happens, because of the amount of support that we already have from some Senate uh, legislators, we're looking to get more. So I'll say that we are in a good position, we're in a good space and a good mm -hmm. place, and we're continuously moving forward. Um, thankfully, I met Brother Anthony, uh, who is now one of our esteemed speakers, because we, we have Fabulous. a speakers bureau okay. specifically designed to speak and go out and talk about and promote uh, solitary confinement. So he is one of our esteemed speakers that go out to the community and inform and educate the community on solitary confinement, mm -hmm. its bill, the legislation we have pending, and as a solitary confinement survivor himself, um, is, is doing an excellent job. So I thank you yeah. for being a part of that. Well, tell us about some of your uh, works that you've been doing since you've been out of prison. I see working with Victor is an excellent start. It was a blessing, actually. Amen. Um, I'll be honest with you. The man has been a blessing to me and a mentor as well. Good. And yeah. when I went down to the National Action Network, actually on January 20th, I became a member. Okay. Uh, six days before, or actually the day that Trump was inaugurated. Mm -hmm. ah. The day Mr. Sharpton okay. said, who's going to become a member? <laughs> <laughs> you were day. influenced, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely, because I heard him all, you know, for years I heard, you know, Reverend Sharpton talk about, come on down, who's going to join then? Yeah, yeah, On the yeah, radio yeah. I would listen to it when mm -hmm. I was upstate. And uh, it was just, it was surreal, but it was a pleasure to get up there and go down the aisle and join the National Action Network. And then Alvin Ponder, uh, I told him my story real quick. He took me back around and meet uh, Sharp, Reverend Sharpton again. And then he told uh, me, he said, man, make sure you take care of him. I want him on my second chance committee. And from there, Mr. Ponder introduced me to Mr. Pate. And the rest is history. We've been doing some great work together. Great. And under his tutelage, I'm ready to, uh, you know, help him to get this bill passed. Mm. You know, but, you know, we got a convention coming up next Wednesday. 18th so, to 21st. Uh, all right. 
So I want to run this piece uh, to give everybody an idea of my, my pastor. <laughs> this is my Saturday church. Yeah, I mean, I've been there 20 years, and, and I get a good word every Saturday. That's right. And I tied every week. Every right week. That's right. That's right. And, that's and, you, and you get a shout-out from the rail. <laughs> <laughs> so, come on, we're going to show the disciple Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. All right? Give a shout-out to Reverend, I, uh, Reverend Sharpton. And run the piece, please. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its dream that all men are created in. Dr. King's dream has not yet been realized, nor will it be unless we have people like Al Sharpton who continue to hammer away at injustices. He, along with the National Action Network, have been laboring in the vineyards of the community for a very, very long time. The groundbreaking things that he's, he's doing is not for fame, is not for glory, is for right. Reverend Sharpton, I want to commend you for the National Action Network's commitment to fight injustice and inequality here in New York City and across America. As someone more eloquently than I said, uh, all, all you need to do for uh, evil to triumph is for good people to be silent. He's bringing up issues that other people are not talking about. When a National Action Network get involved in an issue, the likelihood that justice will prevail dramatically increases. Al Sharpton wants to take the streets back from gun-toting thugs who murdered innocent people this summer, including four-year-old Lloyd Morgan. Well, we are about people's rights to bear arms. Well, we are I'm not accepting this because I know it doesn't have to be like this, and I won't accept it. His decisions to champion social justice are not a function of geography, ethnicity, color, but are really a function of what I would call his moral standing as to how he views the world. And as we now see the maneuvers to undermine the Voting Rights Act, it started again in Florida. Yeah, it did which is why we're gearing up all over this state to protect the democratic process. Our independence was declared a long time ago, and we're still trying to get it right. Voting rights is under assault. Literally five million people, according to the Brennan Institute, may be disenfranchised. But Reverend Al, this is just scandalous what is going on in Ohio. If we go the way we are today, 197,000 Ohioans will be refused the right to vote. I mean, how do we even think we can justify this? It is the height of hypocrisy. There is no justification for it. Because we've come such a long way, there might be a belief that we've arrived, and that's so far from the truth. There is an all-out assault on us, people of color, women, elderly community, the disabled community, if we allow our rights, our voting rights, to be taken away, the next thing will be another right, and we will continue to lose our rights until we have no rights. The pain cut too deep. We suffer too much to go part of the way on the journey. We cannot stop. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. While these truths may be self-evident, They've never been self-executing. You know, community can come together as a family and stand up for each other. Sometimes you don't realize what you have until it's time to use it. The voice for the voiceless. He has stood strong against the rage of hatred and bigotry. With over 60 chapters nationwide, a host of dedicated volunteers, and thousands of members who are spread out all across the nation. We work tirelessly to balance the scales of fairness and equality. If you do what civil rights groups like the National Action Network have always done, if you put your shoulder to the wheel of history, then we can move this country towards the promise of a better day. To lift up not only the African American community, but the broader American family. But we've still got more work to do.
And so the mission has been successful, but it's still incomplete. Because until we can legitimately say that every single American has a fair shot at the American dream, then there's still tremendous work to be done. I truly understand now what Dr. King, Malcolm X, I mean, et cetera, et cetera, I knew what they was fighting for. 150 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, we ask that where our paths seem blanketed by thrones of oppression, we ask for your guidance toward the light of deliverance. We're the children of dreamers that look biting dogs and fire hoses in the face and defy death, singing, we shall overcome. The road is hard and it's long, but you know, we built for it. There's no limits for me. The sky is the limit. We're the children of the dreamers that saw us here when we couldn't see ourselves. We go march together because we just begun to fight. Yeah, now uh, that's my church, mm -hmm. <laughs> Reverend Sharpton. Uh, but this is five years old. <laughs> this is 2013. But uh, next Wednesday, starting uh, on the 18th, uh, we'll have a convention at um, the Sheraton Hotel. You can call, uh, oh, I should have put the numbers up there, 877-626-2651. That's 877-626-2651. Oh, call and make your reservations. It's free. At the Sheridan. <laughs> Eric that? Holder will be speaking. Eric correct. Holder, we've got Former a lot of stars Attorney General. There. Yes. And Victor Pate is part of a. What, what's the name of your panel? I'm going, I'm going to be on a panel that's called a Mayor's Panel for Reentry, uh, where former, former Governor McGreevy is going to be the moderator for four mayors from New Jersey and myself and a few other people that work on uh, reentry issues. Mm -hmm. uh, for people uh, formerly incarcerated. And, and just quickly, before I forget, because they'll get me if I don't mention this here, <laughs> and just, just really is like a good segue because you're talking about civil rights, voting rights, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. They're things that uh, many people suffered and died for. Right. Um, and I'd just like, you know, for our audience to, to, to sort of like be tuned into this. And it's one of the things that, you know, it's part of the disenfranchisement process, but mm -hmm. how it has been extended on, in all arenas uh, for people that have been criminally justice involved. That's right. There's a disenfranchisement That's process. Right. But more particularly, I'm speaking to voting rights for people that have been in prison and are now home and that are on, currently on parole. You're talking about Anthony. Yeah. <laughs> And we are, we are engaging in a new campaign um, that the National Action Network okay. has, uh, is one of the spearheads along with about 16 other criminal justice reform organizations. It's called Restore the Voting Rights New York. And specifically, it is designed to restore voting rights to people that are on parole in New York. Mm -hmm. Currently, New York, New York's law does not allow you to vote if you are on parole. Okay. If you're on probation, you can vote. But mm -hmm. you're barred from voting while you're on parole. So we now have a new campaign to restore voting rights for people that are on parole. We have uh, an assembly sponsor of the bill who is Danny O'Donnell, and we have a mm -hmm. Senate sponsor who is Leroy Comrie. Oh, and yeah. we, are, yeah, we are actively recruiting uh, people, formerly incarcerated people, family members of people incarcerated, concerned community citizens, because if we're talking about rehabilitation, if we're talking about second chances, if we're talking about restorative justice, why do we stop at voting rights? Right. Okay. So what we're saying as part of the campaign, that's part of the restorativeness of a person that has been in prison, mm -hmm has reformed themselves, mm -hmm. right, and is out in society, if they have been deemed eligible to return to society, then just as well as they are deemed eligible to return to society, then their rights 
should be returned to them. Amen. Because that is part Amen. of the restorative justice, that is part of second chance, mm -hmm. and it is part of <coughs> allowing a person to fully reintegrate back into the community by being able to participate in civic engagement. Okay. Voting rights is part of civic engagement. Voting rights is part of your constitutional mm -hmm. rights. So if you have been to prison, done your time, right. and are now back in society, but although you're on parole, then your rights should also be returned to you. And as a person that is currently on some parole, why are you being denied the right to vote? Well, we're in the process of getting that change. Well, and I, we're doing I, the restore I'm excited to, to hear how you've uh, affected Anthony. I mm -hmm. mean, Anthony is a classic example of your mm -hmm. good work. All right. Well, come on, Anthony. <laughs> come on. Well, again, I mean, this is why I'm working with him, because I want to be an advocate for myself as well. Okay. You know, as well as right. others that are still left behind. Yeah, right. Um, there are so many men that are fighting to get out of prison that deserve a chance, as far as I'm concerned, right, right, that right. were in prison before me. Right. I have a friend. Uh, his name is Larry Johnson. And he's been in prison 36 years. 36. And he just got 18 more months. So by the time he goes back to the board, it'd be a total of nearly 38 years. And his crime is no different than mine. Mm. And um, it's just sad to see men being warehoused. Not um, for murder, mm -hmm. but for Actually, this, unfortunately, this was a murder as well. Um, but, but he, he, was, he was sentenced to 25 years. Why is he doing 38? OK. That's the question, mm. you know? Was and something he did in prison? No, he didn't do anything in prison. He's, he's been productive while in prison. You know? well, why did it stretch to 38? Well, it's a way to keep people employed. Mm. Whoa. The, the longer you keep men in prison, the longer people will have jobs and opportunities in these rural neighborhoods way upstate where the prison sustains the community. Ah, okay. They, otherwise, it'd just be farms. So white supremacy is mm. stretching into the... For a long time. Mm. For a long, long time. time. See, that's where even where the vote is concerned, what mm -hmm. you were talking about. Yeah, because they get the power of... They got, they got these sen state. senses. Uh, they, they, <laughs> they count us toward right, the senses. population. Mm -hmm. right. They use us to cast federal uh, dollars, the, the and you're getting get nothing yeah. out in of return. that federal you Explain money. that. Break yeah. it down for me. Wait, wait, no, wait, yeah. Go ahead. Go you, ahead. No, you know it better. Y'all know it better than me. So... When, you, when you're incarcerated, you know, of course, you're no longer in the community or no longer in the local area that you came from. And while you're in prison, and part of the prison centers of the town in which you are a current resident, you are counted as a resident of that county, which in turn mm -hmm. allows that county to be eligible for federal dollars, mm -hmm. state dollars, city dollars, whatever type of dollars that may be going around based upon that locale census. Mm -hmm. So because you have such a large amount of people that are being held in these prisons and jails that are on these upstate rural counties, you're being counted as a resident of that county because you are mm -hmm. currently a prisoner in so that the county. So the county uh, that Sing Sing is in, the county of Sing Sing and they is in, it might have 100,000 people in that county and uh, In addition to the prisoners. Right. In addition yeah, to the prison, a few thousand so they more. counted as three hundred people, three hundred thousand. Well, 300, well it won't be a hundred thousand, but you, you, you say probably 50, more than that. You, no, that's not going to be more than that. The prison holds twenty three hundred, seventeen hundred people. Okay, but still, it adds on. And we're not a part of the, really the, 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 the census because we're in prison. How many, we don't benefit from that. How many, how many people are in the largest prison? In Attica is probably mm -hmm. one of the larger prisons, and in, in Clinton, Dan and Morris, like 2,300 people there. Is that all? Mm -hmm. I thought yeah. it was much more than that. Nah, not, not here. In, in, in California, they have these big, large okay. prison systems, 100,000 people, Okay. Um, but not here. If, and, if uh, the federal government per capita is giving $100 per person. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And the population of that county is uh, 5,000 people. And the prison has 2,000 people. Mm -hmm. you're, mm -hmm. all, you're increasing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. your population by almost half. 50%. Mm -hmm. That's right, mm -hmm. almost half. Mm -hmm. So when you take 2,000 times 100, that money is coming back to those people who are living outside of the prison. Mm -hmm. None of that money goes to the people inside the prison. So okay. they can take that money, use it for education, paving the roads or whatever it is, mm -hmm. and the inmates get nothing. Ergo, mm -hmm. when you come back to the community <coughs> now on parole, if you could be utilized in the census for money, you should be able to be utilized for the vote. That's right. Mm -hmm. Coming back home. Mm -hmm. That 
that benefit should come back to your community. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because the community is also Absolutely. benefiting when you're voting Absolutely. and taking part in the process. What are some of the other things that you're doing, Anthony? Um, I just want to back, again, backtrack a little bit. Um, okay. When I was away after getting my education, I decided that education or application, education without application means anything. Mm -hmm. So I began to work with a program called, as you may remember, it's called Scare Straight. Oh, yes. Yeah. Ah, yeah, okay. yeah, For the called, kids. Yeah, we call it a youth right. awareness program. So, For the young adults. Yeah, and we okay. would not try to scare them. Um, cause I, been, I went through a program like that myself when I was younger. And you may be scared for a moment, but you're not even scared because you know they can't really do nothing to you. You know you're going to leave. Um, but so you're getting a rep by being in prison anyway. But you, what you, I'm sorry. I'm saying you, you, you're getting a reputation. You know what I mean by that is when I went through the program myself as a child, as a kid, okay. myself, mm -hmm. scared straight. Right. Um, it, you know you couldn't do nothing to me, so I knew I was leaving, so the program wasn't effective in that sense. But what we do now, we educate people. Okay. And hopes of them making better choices with, with mm -hmm. their lives than we made with our own. So you so, give yourself. So I share my story. Yeah. I, I, I'm very passionate about when I speak to these young people because it's like I'm talking to myself uh, 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. and so sometimes I get emotional and I would, and they would really open up and say, wow, man, we didn't know you, nobody cared. Right. And I think that's a big problem in our community as well. Um, our young people, from what I see, they don't like us. They don't like uh Old heads, they call them. <laughs> you know, they don't, they don't, they don't trust us, and they, and they felt like we let them down in some way or another. How's that? Well, I mean, when you think about the crack era, those babies were oh. left to themselves. Yeah. You know, and then they had babies, yeah. so yeah. they didn't know what they were doing. And now these kids yeah. are growing up today, yeah. you know, with no sense of direction and, and a sense of hopelessness. Yeah. You, you talked know? about the trip your mother would make. Hmm. Yeah, my mother was, when I first started uh, my incarceration, my father started his incarceration, she would travel from Far Away, Queens um, to 59th Street and then take a eight, nine hour ride upstate mm. uh, one way and then had to ride eight, nine hours back the other way. So it would be a 24 eight, hour. nine hours. Mm -hmm. What time did she have to leave the house to get to 59th Street to On get time, the bus? On time to get the bus. You would say two, three in the morning. Uh, she would get to 59th Street, wait out there in the cold, or the, or the summer heat, with a bunch of other women, by the way. These are women, these are women that make these, these treks um, upstate and wherever else you go. Um, and they full, the visiting rooms are full with women. Mm. Um, and it would be a 24-hour day for my mother. And she did that. I was incarcerated for 30 years, five months, 25 days. But let's not forget my father came up state in 1975. So been, she did it for 41 years. Mm. Do the women get the visits in terms of you know, people coming to visit them? Because the female population has increased. I was going to say that substantially over the years. Unfortunately, the fastest growing uh, prison population are females, um, black females, mm. and sadly they don't get the visits that men get. They're sort of forgotten about if their mothers or their grandmothers or their children don't come to see them. The visit rooms are very sparse, and not too many people up there seeing them, so they don't get the support that they need. So the men are not getting up early in the morning mm. to go see no. the lady. They're not getting up at all, not even early That's in the right. morning. They're just not getting up. That's unfortunate. I won't say all men. Of course, you're gonna have some men, mm -hmm. but I mean the majority, they don't do that. Yeah, in comparison to yeah, the, the male facilities, you might as yeah. say, you know, majority. And so. I've heard this story numerous time from a few <clears throat> females that are, are part of, um, uh, of a female group of women that are formerly incarcerated mm -hmm. and then one of the issues that they all bring out and they talk about how <coughs> you know in the females facilities like the, vo the, the visiting rooms are just almost bare mm -hmm. um, and devoid of the, the men in comparison to mm -hmm. the male facilities when it's you know almost packed to the brim with fem females with children and stuff like that there. Right. So unfortunately, um, men are not supporting these women that are in these prisons and jails, and it's a sad case where a lot of time, a, a lot of these women were in jail because of these men. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, I'm glad not, you hit that. They're mm -hmm. not going to visit mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, and that's a sad uh, situation. And like uh, Brother Anthony pointed out, it's people of color. You know, mm -hmm. and you got these women that's doing, I mean, large sums of time. And they hardly get any visits, if any visits at all. How do we change this um, badge of courage uh, to go to the prison? Um, why do we make that 
takes, why do the kids still take so much pride in saying, I've been to Rikers? Mm. You know, how do you turn that around? We have to turn the mindset around that it's cool to be a gangster, it's cool to be tough. Because to me, I always tell But that's them, all in the music and everything else. Yeah, that's part I, of the planned genocide. Mm -hmm. But I always told young people, because not only did I work with the Youth Awareness Program, working with young people coming inside the prison, I work with my peers as well. And okay. I dealt with gangs inside the prison. Okay, all right. So, um, all right. You that's know, shit. That's yeah, they, look, they, they looked up to me, too, in, in the sense that I was a gangster. But okay. I, I had did the time. I had, you know, I had time in. I had lived a certain lifestyle when I was out there. And we talked about the totem pole of people that commit crimes in prison. As Victor knows, top of the totem pole is a murderer. Someone okay. that commits murder. Right. Someone that commits rape is at the low part of the totem pole. Okay. Or abuse of a child. child. Mm -hmm. You know, so I was at the top of the totem pole. I was well known, Fu Quan, that was my name. I was a five percenter back in the days from Far Rockaway. So I made, like Victor said, mm -hmm. I made a name before I even came to prison. So I was sort of respected once I got there already. Red yeah, Carp body. Was, yeah, <laughs> I had a body. Red Carp was rolled up for me. Mm -hmm. And then I began to make a name for myself in prison. Unfortunately, I wanted anybody to know I had a lot of time to do. I'm not the one to be messed with, so I did things that to let people know I wasn't to be messed with. Okay. Um, but what I say to change their attitude is to let them know, man, that's not cool. Like real gangsters take care of their families. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, that's right. a gangster right. to there me. There you go. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's right. what I'm out here trying to do. And I've been afforded the opportunity because I had a vision for myself before I came out of prison. This is way before I went to a parole board. Mm -hmm. I got my master's degree in 2007. Amen. I had 10 years, a decade wow. still left. Mm. So I had to figure out what I was going to do. So what I began to do is just give up myself. I became a servant. And, you know, Jesus, they say, was the best servant yeah. there was. Servant yeah. leadership. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah, Serving leadership. So I began to do that. And I forgot about my time. I forgot about myself. And I, I began to help other young black males that were around me. Amen. I began to help anybody, but just particularly with black males around me. Yeah. And I wanted to do that work. And I began doing that work. I became passionate about it. And I began to develop a vision of myself, what I was going to do when I came out. Because that was the mm. biggest piece for me, to be able to develop that vision mm. so I can walk mm. out of this situation and have something to go to. Mm. Mm. And that vision is still coming together now. With, it came together with my housing. It came together with my employment. It came together with meeting Mr. Pate over here, mm. with meeting you gentlemen. Mm -hmm. And I'm just excited about the opportunities that I have. I work now in Manhattan, East Harlem, and a brand new program uh, started by Mr. Mm -hmm. Cy Vance Jr., I'm so thankful to him, the Manhattan District Attorney. He mm -hmm. started a program called Community Navigators. Mm -hmm. It's a criminal, inju criminal justice investment initiative mm -hmm. um, to, uh, you know, to lower crime and to help young people, particularly inside of East Harlem residents, to get connected to services. Give, a, give me a second. We'll say goodbye to our Manhattan audience, okay. and we'll be back in a minute. You know, it's all mental, and, you know, keep with the God that lies within them. The God in me loves the God in you. Stay tuned for more of the Gilchrist experience. It's all mental. Remember, it's all in your mind. You have to change that for good. Love instead of hate, and especially against each other. Amen. Power to the people. Come back. We've got another minute. Yeah. Um, just It's just a great opportunity, and I'm, I'm thankful they have a criminal justice. The irony is that the jobs that I'm working with is a criminal justice investment initiative. Mm -hmm. You know, how ironic is that someone that's just coming from prison, this is my first job. Uh, I, did, I worked when I was younger, not really in any menial jobs, um, but now I have an opportunity to help East Harlem residents. And just to give you a snapshot of my life, I just paid taxes. Mm. Mm. For the first time, <laughs> and I'm 52 years old. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, that's just crazy within itself. Mm -hmm. um, How does it feel? It feels great because I got back a nice return. Yeah, right? That's right. good. All right. I got back a nice return, <laughs> so I'm happy about I'm that. But, but you know what? They, but you know the funny <laughs> thing about it is they didn't. Know, they, they still don't know who I am. I, I have to prove who I am. Mm -hmm. So I have to go down to IRS when your number comes order, up in, in order to get my money. Oh. Power to the people. God bless. <laughs> Yeah.